I don't know much about a lot of things, <laughs> so you may end up hearing some stuff that's not really um, true, and I'll try to tell you if I, if I don't know what I'm talking about. But I, but I have spent some time thinking about frames and wheels and tires and saddles and things. So if there's anything that you guys want to know, um, let fly. Um, if you don't ask anything, I'm going to start selling you bikes. <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, let's see. Most of the stuff I've been working on lately has been based on trying to improve the fatigue strength of parts, or at least study and understand um, the fatigue strength of parts. Fatigue is something that um, most people don't know much about unless you've been an engineer, um, other than what happens to your legs when you try to climb a hill. It's not the same thing as what I'm working on. Um, fatigue is um, a, a particularly interesting thing. If you take a, a, a mechanical part and you load it in a way that doesn't cause it to bend in any given um, load, that is, if I grab onto the handlebar and push down really hard, it'll snap back to where it originally was and you won't know that there's anything done to it. And for the most part, that's true. Um, unless you actually bend the handlebar down, you didn't do anything to it. But if you decided that you wanted to know whether you could do that 100,000 times, times or not, um, it turns out that there is something interesting that happens and that with a lot of handlebars, especially the ones that are made on, on high performance bikes that are lightweight, um, you can't push down on them too many times before they fall off. And there's, there's a pretty distinct difference between what happens if you bend handlebars down or if you crash and bend them and what happens if you, is, if you have a fatigue failure. A fatigue failure in a metal handlebar always ends up with one half unattached to the bicycle. Um, and you can imagine that's a real problem because typically the way that happens is you go over a big bump, you land or a jump or something, you land and the next thing you know you're holding on to part of the bike and it isn't really part of the bike anymore. So there are some pretty easy ways to, um, to solve those problems and what we've tried to do from the point of view of making things light and safe is before we sell anything to make sure that the thing's pretty well sorted out for that, that you aren't going to have that problem. With respect to our frames, we worry about it because one, if anything ever happened in the front of the bike, it could, it could hurt somebody. But also because we have a good warranty on our bikes and we want the bikes to last for a really long time. The, um, none of this would really matter. I mean, I come from a motorcycle racing background and that's what I did before I worked on bicycles. And between races at a world championship race on the Honda that I worked on, we would replace a quarter of the motorcycle and just throw away the old stuff. Now, with the, with the stuff that's currently being made and sold on bikes, even the worst of it, as long as you knew that you had to replace it every three months or six months or a year or whatever, um, you'd never have a problem. And so if you were like we were then and we knew what we had to do to keep the thing going and safe, there wouldn't be any problems with fatigue. On the other hand, if you're buying a bike and you don't know how long the parts last, or should last, and you have, um, you assume that it's just going to last until you crash it hard or somebody <coughs> steals it, um, then concerns about fatigue failures in the parts become significant to you. We, we design parts, for the most part, based on the assumption that you like to ride, you want to ride all the time, you'll maintain the bike a little bit, but not too much, um, and that if you wanted to ride the bike hard for five years or ten years or whatever, that unless you hit a tree or rode it over a cliff, that you would be able to do that without the bike breaking. And that's, that's the philosophy that we try to operate with. We don't make things that are new and, and make them out of gee whiz materials just because the materials are available and they're the latest fad. It takes years to sort out the best way to do some stuff. Um, and if you want to be first to market with it, whether it's a suspension bike or a titanium frame or a, a metal matrix composite frame or whatever it is that's the latest thing. Um, it's pretty hard to do that and be certain that the engineering's right, that the thing will hold up, that it'll be safe in a crash, all those things. Um, so we take our time on that. Um, and that's because it's really important, we think, to, to do that. And it's because the way I ride and the way I, the people that I typically used to work for ro rode when I made custom bikes and learned how to make frames, um, it wouldn't work to have a bike that wasn't sorted out before we started. It wouldn't be fun to ride a bike wondering whether the you know, next big bump you hit, the thing was going to come unfastened. So that's what we do. Um, I don't ride that hard. <laughs> I don't take that many chances anymore. I've got a family and I've broken enough bones now to, to know better. 
Um, but I still remember back in the days when I um, took chances and would um, prefer not to have the thing come unfastened underneath me. Um, what else? Any questions? Yeah. Um, what type of tubing are you starting out with? We, um, we work with True Temper. Um, we work, pardon me? 41. Yeah, it's all 4130 steel. It's, it's seamed steel. It's, it's what's called drawn over a mandrel. They take flat stock, they roll it into a tube, they weld it along the seam, they draw it through a bunch of mandrels, heat treat a bunch. You can't find the seam as long as it's been done right. Um, the reason we work with them, a couple of reasons. One, they're easy company to get along with. They're, they're in Tennessee and Mississippi and stuff, but they're not in Japan or, or, or Italy, so we can threaten them with, with phone calls and plane tickets if things go wrong. For the most part, they don't. Um, and they're easy to work with in the sense that they know that they respect what we know and they're willing to do what we want to the extent that it's possible. So if we say we want a tr tube with this kind of heat treating and this kind of strength, they'll say, oh gee, that might be kind of hard to do. But if, there's, if it's possible, they'll spend a little money and time and figure it out and, and either tell us, no, you guys are off the mark or yeah, we can do that. And you know, by golly, the tube's really strong when we do that. And so we've, we've been able to raise the strength of the tubes over the last, say, three years significantly because of that willingness for them to, to work with us. And they learn stuff from us. We learn stuff from them. That works out. Um, they give us pretty good prices because they like us to use the tubing. It's to their advantage that we do. Um, we tried to get, it, get them to give us a little better price if we put one of their stickers on the frame, but they didn't want it that bad. <coughs> and. Um, we know that, that they'll give it to us. A lot of times, um, being a small manufacturer, we make 1,000 to 2,000 frames a year, depending on what kind of year we got. And some companies, if they sell out their production, will start ignoring orders. And so um, if were we to go with a, another company and they didn't respect our order or they didn't really care too much about how their relationship w went with us, we could place a big order for their tubing. and six months later when it's supposed to arrive we don't get any and we make a phone call and they say well sorry you're out of luck we, we decided not to ship it to you well, we'd be out of business you know there'd be nothing we could do so with true temper um, that's always a possibility I suppose but it's never really worked out that way that's one of the reasons why we picked pick going with them originally since then it's turned out that we've been able to make um, tubes that are better than anybody else's so what wall um, on the race frame, the ends of the, the um, top and down tube are nine tenths of a millimeter, and the centers are six, t six tenths. Then it varies around the rear triangle. So they're doing all your custom drawing. Yeah. And stuff. For the most part, what we do is we work from tubes that they have um, existing tooling for, and then we'll change lengths around a little bit. Occasionally, we ask for stuff that they're not used to doing, and then it. it we were always kind of leery of doing that because we could imagine them coming back and saying, well, yeah, for $50,000 we can make that tube for you, you know. Um, but it turns out that a lot of those companies have huge inventories of dyes that they've used for this or that project that they, they don't even know they've got. You know, it's, they're sitting in some warehouse somewhere. And so now we work with them in, in sort of a cooperative way where we tell them what we want and they tell us, oh, well, we did this thing a long time ago and we've got these tubes and it's pretty close to what you wanted and we'll sort of negotiate that way. And we, it, come to find out we almost never compromise on what we want. They've got some tool that they used for some USCF project a million years ago or something and they've, it's been g gathering rust on a shelf somewhere. So um, they can custom draw tubes for us um, whenever we want to. Does that give you access to a range of wall thicknesses? Um, yeah, the race light tubes for example are the same outside diameters as what we've um, got but we use lighter gauges everywhere. And on smaller frames, we substitute in lighter, lighter tubes than we use on the really big frames. Um, I thought that might be which. <laughs> but, but it does allow us to customize. We can't get too carried away with it because they're, they're become, um, it gets to be a problem if you end up with a different tube set for every frame. Um, but to the extent that we can, we, we end up um, moving stuff around to try to make sense out of that. I have another question. On your fabrication, um, can you go over the steps of of heat, do you heat treat your uh, frames after you weld them? No. You don't? No. Because I'm, I'm designing something right now, a rear suspension for a Baja, and I'm using 4130. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem that I'm finding out now is, is heat treatment. Um, you don't plan to become a frame builder next week, do you? 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's always been, you know, I like mountain biking, but no. Okay, well, here's the way it works. Um, for us, you're, you're right. If you TIG weld or fillet braze or do whatever to a, a, a steel tube, you take all the advantages that you got with a, a high strength tube as it's <coughs> delivered to you and you lose those around the areas that are welded. The, um, the issue is when, when, you, when, you get a when you buy a tube like this, the, the manufacturer of the tube will tell you something along the lines of it's this strong and it is, um, um, has this kind of um, yield strength and it has this sort of hardness and it weighs this much. And you can do all sorts of engineering based on those numbers. Um, stronger the tube is, in principle, the lighter it can be, and you can achieve the same strength in the frame. The problem with steel and titanium and <coughs> aluminum and any other material that you want is that if you heat it up while you weld it, you lose a, a lot of those properties. So we have tubing here that has a yield strength that's on the order of 180,000 KSI, which is very strong for a 4130 tube, twice as strong as a typical commercial tube. But when we weld it, we end up with material that's less than half that strong. So we use gussets. You know, the, the idea of the gusset is to, to make the joint back, to make the joint behave as though you didn't lose any of that strength. That's the bottom line. If, if you made this frame and could reheat treat it, as he suggested, um, completely, then you could make everything back up to 180,000 pounds per square inch and you'd be happy. When you weld it, you can't have that. But when you use the gusset, the way the gusset's shaped and the way it works, um, you end up with the material that's most that stressed the highest in a head-on collision or a jump in this case, um, back to the original strength. And that's the idea of the gusset. So you're stress relieving though, after work? No, no, and we think that's really important. You can, there's a bunch of ways to manage, that's a little bit more complicated discussion actually, what happens in the actual weld areas and what you'd want to do to relieve stresses. If you're making um, airplanes and the framework is connected together everywhere, the typical um, method of removing stresses that are in the joints are to go back and heat everything up with a torch and gently cool it down slowly. The reason for that is when you, when you weld something together, if you watch the tubes moving around in space before you close the main triangle up, you find that as you heat and cool them, the tubes are moving all over the place. The, the tubing expands when you heat it and contracts when you cool it. Well, there's no guarantee that it's going to end up back to where it, should, where it started from when you're done with the whole welding operation. So something like this can have a lot of stress in it when you're done. You, if you sawed it open, you'd find it sprung open, um, and that would sort of demonstrate that there was all kinds of um, stress in there. The aircraft guys have to remove that stress, or the air, airplanes fly out, fall out of the air. That's a bad thing. Um, bikes can't fall quite as far, so we probably don't worry about it quite as much. So they heat the whole thing back up, and that means that the whole area is relieved of stress, but the whole area is also weakened because you've heat, heated it. They aren't worried so much about the strength of the thing as they are the stiffness of the structure and the fact that it won't fail in fatigue. We want to preserve the strength. So we have some other tricks that we do that will remove those, those residual stresses but not throw away the strength. As long as I'm assured that you're not a competitor, I can tell you about that someday. Such as? <coughs> Shot peening and surface modification. It's really obvious, just the read an engineering book. Right. You can figure it all out. It, it really works. You just okay, got to believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about right. Because you lose half your strength through the weld. Right. It's even worse than that, actually. You have to be, you know, it even gets more severe if you don't do anything. Um, on the other hand, if you do a little bit, you get a lot of the advantages back. And if you do as much as we do with gussets, then you get all the advantages back. The, um, one of the things we were talking about when we came up here is... Um, Gussets work pretty well, and it's pretty easy to, to verify that. I mean, you can believe us, or you can do experiments or whatever, but it's really easy to tell how much stronger the frame gets when you put gussets on. You can crash into things a fair amount harder and not break the frame. You can ride it for years without having fatigue failures. Why doesn't everybody in the industry put gussets on? A lot of the aluminum guys have figured this out, you know, the, their gussets on the front, front of frames. Um, it turns out that it takes a long time to put gussets on. You know, it takes us as long to weld all the little gussets on the frame as it does to weld the frame together. So if you're staring at the production costs of doing that and you aren't sort of devoted to the idea of having a really strong frame, um, gussets don't look really good because it costs a lot of money to do it. And it's, they're really hard welds to do. It takes a much higher skill, it takes much higher skill on the part of the welder to execute the gusset welds well as it does to do the simple mitered joints. 
Anything else? Could you explain the difference between your gusset and a conventional one to, to everyone? Oh, your, your first. yeah. See if I can move Rick's bike around without dropping it. The, the biggest difference in the gusset, or without destroying the display, is, um, can you guys see this? The, the gussets are, are scalloped along the bottom. You can see it on the chain stay as well. They're cut out along the backside in a circular section here, and then they're not welded around that section. The, the welds come down the sides and then stop. That's planned. We didn't forget to do the weld. Um, though most people won't do it that way because they're afraid of what they don't know. The, the object of the, the thing is to leave the material, as I said in the, when I answered the earlier question, to leave the material that's most highly stressed in the same condition as it was when it left the steel mill. And so if you made the weld around that area, what you would do would be to heat affect all that area that now is the, the material that's stressed the most highly. The shape of the gusset in that area is, is, is done so that there isn't a big um, stress riser. There isn't a big change in stress right at that spot. And the fact that it's not welded in that area um, is what allows us to do that without just moving the, the point where the failure will occur back to the end of the gusset. There would be a reason to do that if you couldn't do anything else. That would still strengthen the frame. But if, if you did that, you'd shoot yourself in the foot. You wouldn't get anywhere near as much of the advantage of, of you doing the gusset this way. The downside of doing it this way is that with a steel frame, you have an opening there that can allow some um, corrosive material in. And so one of the things we have to do is worry about um, clogging that area up with a sealant and making sure that the, um, there's no way that water can get in there. And the biggest problem is with people who sweat, and especially if they ride rollers in the wintertime or something and sweat drips off their chin and lands on the top tube and then rolls around underneath. I mean, you can take the, the paint right off of a frame in a, a month or two that way. Um, but if you just rinse it with clear water, you know, it's no big deal. Um, and all bikes have that problem around, uh, around the cable guides and things, so it's not something that we, we only worry about. How are you coming up with the size of the gusses? What type of analysis are you making? Um, we guessed originally, and then since then we've proven it with finite element analysis. It turns out that if, if the gusset comes back a little further than the diameter of the tube, you protect the, the top part of the gusset from stress, which is what another question a lot of people ask is why the gusset doesn't go all the way around. Well, it does by being as long as it is. If it were a lot shorter, it would have to go all the way around. It was a lucky guess, but we, we sort of sorted it out afterwards. Your front wheels are going to be radial laced for 94. Um, you, you pretty much have to ask the, the sales department about that. Um, I've been riding radial laced wheels on my bike for six months and the guys that we work with in England have been doing it for over a year. The object of the thing is to, everyone complains about rock shocks and suspension forks being too um, um, wiggly up front, not rigid enough. If you ra lace a wheel radially, you can stiffen it side to side and it's a cheap thrill. It, it makes the wheel lighter, it makes it a little bit stronger, it makes it stiffer side to side. The only question is whether the hubs can sustain that load. We haven't seen a Shimano hub break that way. Um, we've broken some prototype hubs, <laughs> so it's not, um, it's not a trivial decision. Do you find that they go out a true, quicker radial lace as opposed to being crossed? No. If the rim's good and round to start with, the, it'll stay round. You know, if you hit a tree or something, it may not. Right, yeah, yeah. But we've had, you know, other than the, the fact that everybody looks at the, at the hub flange and kind of counts their teeth and decides that it may not be a good idea, um, there's no good reason not to do it. But that's a really good reason not to do it. If you suspect that your hub couldn't take it, then you really wouldn't want to do it. Um, and we had some prototype hubs fail. Um, they were probably made out of uh, material that we won't actually make production ones out of them. On the rear wheel, do you uh, use different uh, gauge spokes, dry side, non dry side? Yeah, um, we've done a lot of research on the strength of wheels side to side. Um, we, we work with race teams, and race teams were using our rims with Polestar hubs and went to a race down at Big Bear and broke half the, half the wheels they had at the race. 
So we, um, we did some research on that. We made a fixture, well actually we had a fixture that we'd been using for some time, but we built some wheels up out of those hubs. And the fixture um, basically clamps on the ends of an axle and applies a really big load right to the side of the wheel and allows us to measure deflections and see what happens. We can do it real slowly and carefully. But it also will just continue loading the thing until it breaks and we can see what the load is that you have to apply to break a wheel. Um, in the process of doing that research we found that by using 14 straight gauge on the drive side only and then lighter gauge spokes anywhere else you don't change the strength of the wheel. That's as strong as it can get and but you can make a wheel lighter. If you change those spokes to a lighter spoke you start losing wheel strength really fast. That, that there's about a 10 or 15 percent difference between a 7 speed XT wheel in lateral strength. The XTR wheel is, is weaker. Um, that's just because it has more cogs on the freewheel and ends up getting weaker because of that. The Polestar and some of the straight pull hubs because the spokes are shifted in even further towards the center line of the wheel are effectively like dishing the wheel over for a, a ninth cog and those things went down another 15 percent in strength. Didn't matter whose rim it was, it could be Mavic, it could be ours, it could be Araya, it didn't matter. So each time you dish the wheel over that much further um, for, for whatever reason, adding a plate to the free wheel or changing the design of the way the spokes attach to the hub, you lose strength in the wheel. We went the other way and we built some six-speed wheels just for fun. You can imagine using a six-speed on a downhill course or on a slalom course where the range of speeds that you needed were smaller, strength went right up. And then we did some sort of trick lacing patterns where all of the um, spokes on the flange on the freewheel side were laced to the outside. So they all stuck out towards the freewheel. Got another 10% in strength. So it was a pretty cool lesson. Um, you can't lace wheels with XTR hubs that way. There's not enough room between the derailleur and the spokes to do it. But anything else you can. When you say wheel failure, are you actually having a rim crack or are you having a spoke pull out? Um, neither. The, the wheels just taco. Oh. It, it's pretty amazing what, what... I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about this because we have some new rims coming out that are... Um, like we have one that's 410 grams and one that's 370 and they're about twice as strong as a standard wheel in a lateral load because we, we had this fixture and we had the finite element um, program and we were able to study the, the problem. And um, the wheels fail in a self-energizing way when they, it's, um, it's really obvious what happens when you, when you break one on the jig. That at some point as you push it over, the thing pulls over the rest of the way on its own. You know that when you build a wheel and you're stressing it. If you push it too far on a road wheel with a light rim, thing just goes flunk and you start again. Um, so some of the things that are, are um, obvious when you start doing that testing can be twiddled with to optimize the strength of the wheel. Um, some subtle changes in the spoke bed um, stiffness can make really big changes in the strength of the wheel. And so in the spring we'll have a rim that um, is for a given weight, roughly twice as strong as any other other rim going, just because we were able to play around with that. Do you end up having a, uh, any problem with the fact that uh, since the rims aren't piloted, when the spoke nipple is coming through, this is the hole is drilled at an angle, do you have any problems, you know, contact between the rim and the spoke nipple, with the alloy nipple? Um, yeah, if you use a good lubricant in that area, you tend not to have a problem. But if it runs dry, you can have a problem. And we're working on an eyelet that can be sold in the aftermarket. It's kind of a half eyelet. So it fits into the hole, um, isolates the nipple from the rim, um, but doesn't add the cost of the full stainless steel eyelet like um, Mavic uses. Or the weight. Or the weight, right. Did you find that, or have you radius the holes uh, in the direction of the spoke nipple and found that made any difference? It's not really possible to do that. From our, from in manufacturing. Now, what about from, uh, basically from a sh small shop standpoint? Just if somebody was building that would help. Increasing bearing area in that area would help. But you have to be really careful because it's hard to know which surfaces to relieve and, and how to do it. The, if you use a brass nipple, you can see exactly because once you tension it up, it sort of mashes the aluminum in a little bit and creates its own bearing. Um, but we think the eyelets will, will pretty much solve the problem completely for anybody. And you can use any nipple you want and you don't have to worry about it. Anything else? What about as far as tension on spokes? Are you pretty much staying with manufacturers <coughs> specs for tension or do you go over or under? Um, we haven't found that over tensioning spokes is a great idea. The, the, the n numbers that most good wheel, wheel builders use, which is a pretty high tension, are, is the best that we've found. Going beyond that um, just, just um, makes the spoke life go down. 
and going much less than that makes the wheel strength go down. So it seems like they've kind of figured it out. Does, is anybody here interested in suspension bikes? I mean, have you guys thought about that at all? Did, do you ride on suspension forks or um, that sort of thing? Did, what do you think? Do you like it? Does it go? No? Huh. The, um, I think that um, from a personal point of view, I like suspension forks. I like the way they ride. I think I can go faster around corners and go over bumps faster. Um, going to a full suspended bike seems to me that that's the same thing's going to happen. From our point of view, the only thing we want to know is that the thing's not going to fall apart in six months. But it seems really straightforward so far in the, in the prototyping that we've done. The, um, the question is though, whether you could actually go faster or have more fun on it. And at this point, I think that's still kind of up in the air. Because really the only time it does you good is when you're hitting really big bumps. And if on a daily ride or a normal ride, you ride single track or, or fire road or whatever, and you're not constantly pounding like you would going around a Norba course, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be much better off with the full suspension. So it'll be interesting to see um, how many people think that they actually have an advantage if they, if they buy all that extra hardware. Isn't there a substantial weight trade-off? Um, well, that's sort of the engineer's problem. You won't sell any if you have to add too much weight. But if you make them too light and they break all the time, then no one's going to be too happy. My guess is that, that the minimum, there's going to be a, a pound, the weight of the shock. Um, if you did everything really well, that's probably about as good as you could do. But if you could make a 22 or 23 pound bike without it, go into 24, especially for somebody who's racing in an Orba race where the, you know, the course is really rough, um, that could be a really big advantage to them. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, with respect to body fatigue, the, um, that's most of what the comments are based on from racers. You know, that at the end of the race, if it's a two hour race or something, that they just can't keep up anymore if they're running um, rigid uh, front ends. They're, but what they don't realize, and what's pretty easy to show, is that you for every bump you hit, whether it's the beginning of the race or the end of the race, you can go a little bit faster if you use suspension. Um, and that's not trivial. That what you're doing is, if without suspension, is you're making up for that in your legs. And at the end of the race, it, it starts um, costing you. So it can be, the energy that it saves you is not just related to upper body absorb, you know, shock absorption. It's overall, you know, heart and lungs and aerobic capacity. There was a pretty interesting study that was published recently where a guy, um, it was at a university back east. They rode a bike on a, um, um, what's it called? A treadmill. And they put, they glued a bunch of two by fours on the treadmill belt. And um, the first problem they had is it's really hard to ride a bike on a treadmill because you're not really going anywhere. So a lot of the stability that you get from actually riding a bike down the road is lost. So they could only find a couple of guys who could actually stay on the treadmill on the bike. And there are all sorts of concerns about going too fast and, you know, the guy riding off and into the lab equipment. Um, so that was one, one thing that they overcame by just getting guys that were really good riders. Um, but they compared, um, they used a Proflex frame and they compared the rider's performance by measuring his oxygen uptake um, with him riding over these two by fours with the suspension completely blocked off and then front only, rear only, and then together. And it turned out that um, his, his oxygen uptake was substantially reduced when he had suspension on the bike. Or sh actually there was one woman in the, in the test too. And in each case the, the oxygen uptake was reduced substantially when they use suspension. And that, that's kind of what I was alluding to there. Did it, did it make a difference between front only versus full or rear only? Um, it turned out that, that um, without was worst. Front only and rear only were about the same. Rear only was a little better. And then both was best. But the, whether or not front only or rear only suspension would work better for you in the field, you'd have to compare what they actually tested to know that. And the, the test was done with the rider seated exclusively. And I'd say that that was why it would favor rear only because you've got a lot more weight on the back wheel in that circumstance. But that overall that may not be 
the case. But it, it showed without question that suspending um, the, that rider's mass and, and making shock absorption work um, reduced the amount of oxygen um, that they were needing to, to, to use to propel themselves. And it, it turns out that for some other arguments you can, you can show that if you need more oxygen you're using energy, burning energy at a, at a higher rate and you'll be able to do less work in a given period of time. So it was a pretty convincing argument. I mean it wasn't just a few percent either, it was like, you know, 15, 20 percent, pretty big chunks. It was a, pr it was a m mediocre experiment, but it proved a lot, I think, and if it got done well, it could prove a lot more. Um, that, to some extent, uh, substantiates climbs of people saying that um, suspension works even going uphill if it's bumpy, and I think that's true. Well, that test, because I read that it was in cycling science, mm -hmm. and that test was, the treadmill was canted at a four degree grade, mm -hmm. so it was basically a test under climbing conditions. Right. Right. Can you talk about um, what you do to the front end for your suspension bikes? I know that you do something different geometry-wise. Right. So right. Yeah, you hear a lot about suspension-specific um, designs, and um, that's kind of a nebulous term right now. It just means that it's okay to have forks on the uh, suspension forks on the bike. What we did was. Um, the first rock shock that was ever made, we put on a Ritchie bike with a 69 degree head angle. And even though the geometry turned out to be horrible on that bike, the bike was really fun to ride because of the forks. But it was obvious right away that the, the thing was suffering seriously when you tried to go around a corner. So we started making bikes um, that um, tried to accommodate the change in length of the suspension. In the process of doing that, what we did was we made a bike with the same geometry as we had on our rigid bikes, but with the fork installed. Um, we guessed that it would be better to have those specs with the fork fully extended than it would be to worry about what happens when the fork compresses. And that guess, so far, we believe is right. The bike worked okay, but it still didn't corner very well. There, it was obvious if you had a motorcycle background, which Turner and I did at the time, that you could do a lot more with the front end of a bike in a hard, bumpy corner if, if you improve the, the front end somehow. And so we, I wrote a program, a computer program, that tried to analyze the rider's weight distribution. And you could go in there and tweak stem length and you know, play around with the top tube length or whatever until you, and you could study the change in the weight distribution of the bike. And what we discovered was that you could, we made another prototype. We assumed that if we increase the weight on the front end a little bit, um, we studied some motorcycles and knew that the weight distribution on a bike was real different than a motorcycle. Unfortunately, the way power is made and the way they're steered under power is real different as well. So it wasn't something that you could say, oh yeah, that's it, it's easy, that's what we got to do. We moved, some, um, moved the wheel back. If you can imagine an experiment where you had a rider with a, an erector set type of bicycle and you could just sort of loosen some bolts here and pull the head tube back a little bit. You, you shorten the front part of the wheelbase from the rider's center of gravity to the front axle. If you had scales under the wheels, you didn't change the overall weight of the bike, you move the front wheel back, the scale in the front would say that you had more weight on it. So the scale on the back, weight's conserved, so the scale in the back says you have less weight on it. We found that the problem we had was in corners, the front of the bike wouldn't stick, it would tend to plow. And mountain bikes, especially with really long top tubes, have that limitation. So that's due to too much weight or too little weight? Too little weight on the front end. And what happens is, it's, it's kind of a tough one to understand, and I'm not sure I really know the exact physics of what happens when you corner, but my, my guess is that small bumps can pick up the front end slightly. And the, the less weight there is on the front, it's kind of a crude way of saying it, it's actually the, the uh, smaller the moment of inertia the bike has about the front wheel, um, the easier it is for that wheel to get picked up under those bumps. And once it does that, it loses traction for a second and then doesn't really recover traction. So you end up with a front end plowing in the corner. It gets a little more complicated than that. It has to do with steering angle and, and, and the way the, the contact patch moves around as you turn. But it's basically that. Um, by making some small changes in the front end, pulling the front end in, we were able to get more weight on the front end and the bike started working better. And most of the way we analyze that is on single track, maybe up to 30 miles an hour. We assume that for the most part, that's where people ride their bikes most of the time. We know that's not true. There are guys in Arizona say though, that they like it better that way anyway. Even though they go 50 down Rocky Hill side sometimes, um, 
it's easier for them to ride around the bike's limitations in that circumstance, and there aren't too many, than it is for them to try to make up for that in the tighter stuff when a bike won't steer. So that's, we've, we've developed some bikes this year for downhill and for dual slalom especially, and we're sort of playing around with what we can do in that area. Um, but for the most part, the way most people ride their bikes, especially in our area and in California, we think that concentrating on single track performance, 30 miles an hour and lower, is, is what um, will make most of the difference for a guy's day if, if they're out riding. Um, we also use a crown from RockShox that has less rake. And that's part of, the, part of the package, pulling the front end in, increasing the trail, um, putting more weight on the front end, um, improves the way the bike corners. Well, the weight distribution I was talking about was for a seated rider. When you get out of the saddle um, and you're going up a steep hill, the real issue with respect to, to climbing is where your center of gravity is and where the back wheel is. If your CG gets behind the back wheel, you just flip over backwards. If you accelerate the bike hard enough with your pedaling torque to where you actually do a wheelie and your CG gets behind the back wheel, you just keep going and fall over backwards. Um, if it's too far in front of it, you don't get any traction. Um, you just spin the wheel. And so the, the relationship of the pedals, handlebars, and rear wheel pretty much establish what happens there. And it, it's, it's kind of unrelated to some other areas of the bike for the most part. Um, and we pretty much left that alone. We've played, we used to, when we had horizontal dropouts, let the rider tune where they like that. And some people like the longer chainstay, which makes the bike corner a little better. Some people like the shorter chainstay, which makes the bike climb better. Some people like short chainstays just because it looks cool and they think it's better to have short chainstays. But um, because a lot of the hubs were coming with, with aluminum flanges, which we hadn't anticipated when we originally designed horizontal dropouts, and you could just yank them out when you um, sprinted on the pedals or, or climbed a steep hill, we had to, to stop doing that. There was no way we could control what kind of hubs were used on our bikes. So now we have vertical dropouts and we had to sort that out. So if you had, you did bring the, the front wheel back did you then uh, extend the stem length, or did you keep that the same as far as others? If you had two bikes the same, so if you brought the front wheel back and you had people climbing, seated, let's say, mm -hmm. in constant position, would you wheelie first on the wheel that's further back, or does that? If you, it, our assumption was that the stem would be extended back to its original location. So we, the way we figured is the guy's going to get on our bike, and he doesn't know whether the top tube's a quarter inch shorter or longer he's going to reach forward and he wants the bars to be in a certain place. So that means that whatever we've shortened the front end, they're going to have to add back onto the stem length. And that's what puts the weight back out onto the front wheel that we want. It, it turns out that bar ends are kind of an interesting feature in that respect. Imagine that you did that and you, you said, I want the bars really stretched out because that's the position I'm really comfortable in when I'm going up long steep hills. At some point, that really compromises your ability to do, to do really technical stuff because you can't shift your weight back far enough behind the saddle to go down something that's really steep and you just end up going over the bars. Bar ends are kind of an interesting compromise there. You can keep your bars back a little closer to you and use the bar ends in those situations where you want to get really stretched out. Then when you get to the serious technical stuff, the bars are back a little bit and it lets you move around on the bike a little bit more. And we've made that change for a couple of racers, and at first they didn't like it because they didn't feel comfortable, but that was because they weren't automatically going for the bar ends when they wanted to get into that time trial or, you know, long, slow hill climb position. Once they adapted to that, then having the bars that, you know, half inch or three quarters of an inch closer to them, let them do a lot more gymnastic kind of stuff around the bike, and they could get away with that, you know, really steep downhill where your chest has got to be on the saddle or you just can't make it. And, but it just let them do that instantly and then get right back out of that position real easily. And that, we think, is really important. There's kind of a trend amongst the, the ex-roadies and the mountain bike Nazis in our area where they just want to have a bike that's about a mile long and have a really short chain stay. And, you know, the, the bars have got to be right about here, you know, really low compared to the saddle because those are cool things. But they aren't always very smart things to do when you want to go fast. What's the difference between the the um, the seat tube and the wishbones are the same. Everything else is different. The the race light tubes are all the same diameter, but they're a thinner wall everywhere, and they're heat treated to a higher higher strength. What's the weight cut off then? It's about a oh we don't do that. 
it turns out that we've had enough 125 pound guys that have broken everything in sight that we think that that's a really bad way of doing it. Um, if you had a 180 pound guy that rode real easy, they could ride one no problem. If you had a 180 pound guy that rode really hard but, but didn't crash into, into rocks all the time, they could ride one. Um, we haven't actually finished the studies, but we think it may actually be as strong in a head-on impact as a, as a race frame, just because of the difference in the heat treating on the frame, but I can't say that with, with certainty. Um, on the other hand, you could have a 135-pound guy that liked to jump over buses who probably should ride the race frame just because it gives him that much more um, fatigue life and that much more um, side, sideways strength. So if he lands off a jump really sideways, the rear end of the thing is a little stronger and will resist um, flexing or bending over. Um, it, it probably has more to do with your riding style than your weight between you know, 130 and 180 pounds. Above 180 uh, probably isn't a very good idea to ride a race light. Not because it's not strong enough, but because you'll find it flexes around underneath you too much when you're, when you're doing really fast stuff. Anything else? Come on, I'll, I'll tell you anything you want to know. Okay, when we decided we wanted to make a really light frame, the first thing we did was make some out of um, SL Columbus road tubing. And that was a really light frame. Um, the problem was that when you put the rear brake on, the only thing that happened was the chain stays flexed apart. Um, the cantilever brakes push in on the rim, and as Newton said a long time ago, those things just push back out on the chain stays. Well, the rim's pretty stiff, and the pads are you know, rubber, but they're also pretty stiff. So what happens is the, the chain stays flex out. We connected the, the cantilever bosses with this, the wishbone loop using a fairly large diameter tube. It's not real heavy wall, but it's a little heavier than some of the other tubes back there in order to get the stiffness that we wanted on that part of the frame. It makes the brake solid. And the way you can do that is you can pull the brake pretty hard and the lever just doesn't come back to the, to the grip. <coughs> we didn't want to put that kind of tubing everywhere in the, in the rear triangle though, because that would add a lot of weight to the frame and it wouldn't really increase the stiffness of that part of it much. So in, instead of doing that, we ended up cutting them off and sleeving in a much lighter gauge tube, basically back to the SL gauge um, seat stay below that. So it gives us the, the strength that we want. It keeps the weight low and the stiffness and strength of the thing otherwise is adequate. We don't have failures there. So it was a way by making the frame a little more complicated to make it a little bit lighter and, and also serve better for the rider from the point of view of using the brakes hard. We're working on a way to do that in a single tube, but it's a really difficult butting operation. And so it's one of those things that we're you know, working towards eventually, but we haven't been in a big hurry to do. Um, no, it doesn't. Actually, it would be a little stiffer probably if it weren't that way. But what we found is that the influence, imagine trying to put a load, a bending load side to side through this really long skinny tube all the way up to the seat cluster. The things that influence the rigidity of this tube are, um, to a large extent, how rigid the tube is from there down. And so by adding a bunch of weight and material up here, you really can't influence the stiffness of the structure much. And we know we don't want to add a bunch more material down there. So by doing this, if you were just to isolate this part of the thing, if you added a bigger tube, you could make it a little bit stiffer side to side. But when you put the whole thing in the assembly and tried to measure how much change that was in the frame, it would be really small. So we, we decided on this, this was adequate in terms of stiffness and strength, but, but reduced the weight of the bike a little bit. The, um, the art of frame building is to, um, to not get carried away on any single area of the frame, to make everything sort of uniformly strong and stiff. And if you, if you blow it um, in any particular area, you just end up paying a really big weight penalty and you don't get much back for that. And that's true of almost all of the bicycle. If you, for example, if you decided you wanted really stiff um, cranks, that is, you didn't necessarily want stiff cranks, but what you wanted to do was push on the pedal and not have anything between your foot and the back wheel where it was attached to the ground stretch much or flex much. Um, you could go out and buy really stiff cranks. Um, that probably wouldn't do much good for you. If you doubled the stiffness of the crank, halved its flex, you probably would affect the whole system by only a few percent. The problem with that is that the bottom bracket spindles the culprit in there. 
if you can, you can do this experiment real easy. You just get the bike and you push the pedal straight out in front of you and you get about five guys to hold it so you can jump on it a little bit and you jump up and down on it. And you can see that what's happening is the bottom bracket spindle's just twisting around. It, it's not very big compared to the crank arm. And so trying to influence the stiffness of the bicycle, if you thought that was a good idea, is tricky. You have to find the, the point, the component in the bicycle that's flexing the most and put all your energy and work into that. And if the bike's designed right, and current bicycles may not be designed that well in that one regard, um, unless there is an area that is really the weak spot, there's really not much you can do about it. On forks, for example, if you wanted to stiffen a fork, you could just work on the steer. When Fisher said he wanted stiffer steers and decided to make them inch and a quarter, he was right. That's, that's the place to influence the, the stiffness of the front end of the bike. So is there a reason that you're not doing that? Huh? Is there a reason that you're not doing that? Yeah, we don't think it really affects how fast you can go and how much fun you can have, and it definitely affects the weight of the bike. Not significantly, no. Um, it's the diameter and the shape of the, the spindle itself that really, that really hurts. By shortening it a little bit, you probably could influence it just proportional to the amount that you shortened it. You might also notice though that those cartridge um, spindles have the, the, the bearing support inboard really far compared to, they were, to where they were before. That doesn't influence the torsional deflection, but it really influences the bending deflection a lot. The other problem is that the race is actually ground into the spindle on those if you ever cut one apart. And you, it just necks down to a real small diameter just inboard of that seal. And so that also sort of defeats the purpose. I think most of that was done so that they could slap them into bikes really fast. The um, Taiwanese assembly factories have air guns that they install those things with. And you can imagine the damage that you could do to a cup and cone set if you had to adjust it with an air gun. Um, so they just they buzz one cup in and it hits the se and seats and they slip the cartridge in, turn it around and buzz the other one in and it just, you know, comes down solid and they're done. And there's, the adjustments are all done internally. I don't think anybody's saying that they're actually a better bottom bracket. What else is up? We have new bar ends for this year. We've been working pretty hard on. They're magnesium tubes and they're coated with a, a powder coat that's kind of um, uh, rough, so it allows a grip, a glove surface to grip really well even though it's wet. Um, we have a new seat post that Rick doesn't have because we actually don't have any yet, but it, they'll be out in a month or so. We've got a carbon fiber seat post that weighs, the lightest one's about 180 grams and the heaviest one's about 230 grams, and they're real flexible. So that we found that if you um, don't support the saddle with a very flexible um, saddle pillar, when you hit bumps, the saddle moves around a little bit and it takes the edge off the bumps. Works really good. We have some that were so flexible they're scary. And they work really good. Unfortunately, they don't hold up. But we had a chance to prove, prove the theory. It's sort of an extreme case. Why not keep, I guess I'm sure, carbon fiber seat posts or for those who still wish to have children are kind of a scary concept. So <laughs> yeah, I have children, so I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, the, the problem with carbon fiber that we found in testing was that it was really strong. But where you tried to clamp it, it would just crush right under the clamp. So we reinforced it on the inside with a piece of metal, um, a, an internal gusset. And wherever you squeeze down on it, um, you have to have that piece of metal on the inside to reinforce it. So what we've done is, is limit the, the, the range that you can clamp on. We had to, to, there had to be a problem with using carbon fiber this way, and that's it. You have to know what length seat post you want. You can't just cut it off wherever you want and, and clamp it wherever you want. The advantage of it is that we, we made a test fixture and the test fixture clamps real rigidly on the end of the, the seat post and applies a load about here to the seat post. And we studied a bunch of seat posts that were out there and we knew which ones bent and which ones didn't and tried to decide how strong a seat post would have to be to work. And working with the composites guys, we've got a seat post that will take, it's over a thousand pound load here without breaking. And the very best aluminum post will barely get over 600. And the, the worst aluminum posts, the ones we know break in the field, are at about 400. So we've got a carbon fiber post that 
unless you do a, a huge impact on the saddle. You know, one of those things where you're 10 feet off the ground and your feet come out of the pedals and you land on the <laughs> saddle, in which case a broken post may not be the worst thing. Um, you, we don't think they're going to break. You know, they, they're, they may be susceptible to what's called bruising, where if you come in and slam it with a rock, you can get a little bit of damage going and then um, later have a problem. But we think the seat post is probably not very susceptible to that kind of damage. So it, it'll probably be okay. We, we tested a bunch of parts in impact as well, handlebars and stems. And it was pretty scary. Um, I don't know how many of you guys ride with carbon fiber handlebars. Is there anybody here? No shop jockeys here that have carbon fiber bars? Um, none of the carbon fiber bars that we tested passed the impact tests. Um, what, mean, what that means, and you can kind of suspect this with carbon fiber, it doesn't bend, it just breaks. There's no such thing as, as plastic deformation or, or bending, yielding in carbon fiber. And so we decided, we worked hard on a carbon fiber bar and it, it, it fizzled out. We, we decided that at a load that a bicycle should never see, you would not want the, the uh, you, let's see, you would want to have to apply a load to the carbon fiber bar, a bending load, that would be so high that you would never encounter that in the field. Or if you did, it would just be in a horrendous crash and nobody would really be too concerned about it. But never like off of a big jump or when you hit a big jump or a big bump. You would never want that load to break a bar. And we investigated all the carbon fiber bars out there and without naming names, none of them passed. It was really straightforward. Um, and answer hyperlight bars passed and inexpensive OEM bars passed. They, they bent, but they didn't break and the hyperlights didn't even bend. Um, and that probably means that our test, <coughs> we did some calculations, we think our test is pretty valid. But it's at this point just a matter of time, we think, based on that test, before somebody hits a bump hard enough on a carbon fiber bar to just have half of it come off in his hand. And one of the British journalists um, that I know was over staying with me last night actually, and he, he was at the World Championships, and there was a really rough big drop-off jump at the World Championships in France and there were half a dozen people that broke handlebars on that jump and they were all fatigue failures and that, by that I mean an aluminum bar no matter how hard you hit it up to a point will just bend over and these were aluminum bars that broke and they just fractured and the guy would you know would hit the ground and half of his handlebar would come off and it had just it was because they had accumulated damage throughout the year hadn't replaced the bars on a regular basis and when they hit that one big load what was left of the bar couldn't support it. It's a pretty serious deal if you think about it. <laughs> um, what else? I, I had a couple here that I, I have some familiarity with that. Um, what else? Where do you guys ride around here? Would you have to drive a long ways to ride, or is this? Can you ride? Do you have to go to the Sierras, or is there, are there hills before that, or? There are a few before that. Yeah, there's a few places that aren't too bad. Most of the real nice stuff is an hour and a half or so away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there aren't too many um, easy rides right out your front door, right out into the trails. Can you ride in the summertime here? I mean, is it, is it, I have this vision of, of Sacramento where you, you can fry eggs, you know, out in the sun and stuff. No big deal? No, you guys are tougher than I am. Huh? Ride by water and jump in. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea. I was in England and they have um, lake jumping contests at the races there. And they do this like a hundred yard sprint and they have a ramp set up in front of the lake and these guys are getting like 20 or 30 feet of air and doing these really big cross-ups and then just landing right in the lake and there was a guy on one of my bikes doing a lake jump on my bike <laughs> i couldn't believe it you know it's like okay get the distributor over here make sure this guy doesn't come in with a rust problem six months from now you know i don't want to buy him a bike it was pretty cool though i mean some of those guys are really good they like do backflips and stuff Um, yeah, we used to play with it when we made custom bikes, but what we found now is that by proportioning the bike correctly, you can get the rider set up right on it, 
without playing around with angles and, and, and stuff. So what we worry about for the most part um, from size to size is varying C-tube and top tube length but we keep the head tube angle and C-tube angle the same. Road guys don't, don't believe that but I have a feeling like that's more tradition than it is based on, on um, what actually happens. Yeah. Yeah, on, well, let's see. I have two suspension bikes now. On this kind of suspension bike, the seat tube's steeper. And again, that's an effort to put more weight on the front end. Um, it's not much, but it's a little bit. Um, and the, the top tube shorter. Again, pulling the rider forward to get weight over the front end. The, the full suspension bikes are pretty different. And we think that there's as we found with this, every time you start adding that kind of system to the bike, there's all sorts of things you can take advantage of. And to, to think that the same geometry would work on a rigid bike and on one of those things is not a very sophisticated way of going about it. Are they still prototypes? Yeah. We have titanium frame prototypes too. We haven't figured out how to... We haven't tested them long enough and had them in the field long enough to know that we can sell them with a warranty. And that's what we, we want to establish before we go any further with them. They're pretty fun to ride though. They work pretty well. We were, we're working with a company and we were able to design our own tube set. So it's not a bike that's just kind of cobbled together from old nuclear tubing. You know, it's, we started from scratch and tried to do it you know, as good as we could. Have, have you guys seen the saddle from the top? Do you know what, what the saddle's all about? We refer, I referred to that, the idea of going down a really steep hill by getting your butt behind the saddle and your, your, your chest here. It's, it's really important to be able to know how to do that when you ride in really technical stuff. There's no way you can ride down a steep hill beyond a certain slope and without going over the bars otherwise. And going over the bars is really a drag. You know? It's like it's really slow and you have a real long time to look around for the soft spot to land. And um, There are places where there's no soft spots. You, know, you just land on the rocks and it's no fun. Um, <clears throat> the top of the saddle is cut away on the back and the reason we did that was because um, the reason I did that is because when I ride on a saddle for the most part I don't touch the saddle there I could reach back and feel that corner of the saddle and it wasn't doing me any good so even though the saddle looks really narrow I think for me, it touches me in all the same places that it would, whether it was a fully um, um, configured saddle or not. This is a San Marco um, road saddle, and it's just been trimmed back on these corners. It's the same shell. So other than the area where it would typically stick out here, there's no difference between the saddle and a normal one. But the difference is that when you try to get the saddle between your, your thighs, and so your butt can be back there to get over... Um, get your weight back over the back wheel and be able to go down a really steep hill it offers much less restriction to doing that and then also it offers a lot less restriction for getting back in front again um, that's the other problem when you go down the steep technical thing usually it's not just an easy rollout at the other side for you to you know gather yourself and get back on the bike so the next thing coming up you may not want to be over the back wheel um, when you're when you're riding there and getting back over the front without getting your shorts caught on the saddle or you know, those things can be sort of critical. And if you get stuck back there, usually you just wobble off and, and crash anyway. It's a better crash than going over the bars, but it's still embarrassing. People are watching. So that's, that's the idea. And the, the basis for it was to, to try to alter the saddle in a way that wouldn't change what happens when you sit on it. We're working on a wider version because a lot of people have complained, especially women, have complained that this saddle doesn't really do it. The, the problem for us in that, we're working on it, but the problem is that the, the concept is to make it so that you can get the saddle um, between your legs and get behind it right away. And making a wider saddle almost defeats that, that um, principle um, from the, the beginning. So it's a harder s problem to solve. But we think by working on the shape of it back there that it'll, we can make it so that it'll be a little bit easier to do. Otherwise it may just be one of those inherently male advantages that can't, can't get around. That's about all I got to say. You, you, don't you have any, like, you know, controversy? Don't you want to know if MMCs will ever work, you know? <laughs> Dirt about Shimano? Anything, you know? We can, I didn't want to turn this into a sales seminar. When are you going to come out with your own pedal, Keith? Um, <laughs> Never, 
Probably never. Um, I think I think about every part. I mean, I have nightmares about pedals sometimes, um, and there are things that I think could be made better about them. The problem is how to how to balance doing that between all the other stuff that's going on. So right now, there's a drawing sitting in the computer of what I think is the next generation of pedals, and probably the way it goes will be that I don't have a chance to do anything about it before somebody else figures it out and gets it on the market. So um, that's. That's probably where, where my pedal project will die. From the point of view of the inventor, I've, it's, it's really easy to think that you've made something better, to make a bunch of them on a milling machine somewhere or whatever, to go out and try to sell them. And there's a lot of guys in the bicycle business that are doing that. And I applaud that in a way, because it's a nice thing to do. You know, if you can make some little widget here or there that makes your bike better, you should go for it. To know that it's really a better part is a lot harder job. And a lot of these guys that are doing it are machinists and not engineers. And they go out and ride with it and they think it's great. And that's good. It may not be better. It probably isn't. Most of them aren't. Um, they're expensive and they're light, but I'd be happy to sort of be controversial and say very few of them actually improve the performance of a bike. Some of them make it a lot worse. And it's hard to know which ones those are until you've bought them, but sometimes it's the way you figure, figure it out. Um, from the point of view of an inventor, it's tempting to always want to make everything better. But from the point of view of making a living, it's really hard to do that. And so what I've found is that even though I think I can, I humbly think that I can do, you know, a given thing better than, than some other people, um, I've learned enough now to know that it's not necessarily the thing I'd want to do, even though I think I could do it. Um, I'll leave it to other people to try to make better brakes right now. And we had brakes that looked a lot like some of the brakes that are being sold right now that we weren't happy with four or five years ago. And we tested them and they were good in some circumstances and really horrible in others. And I wasn't willing to answer the phone and explain to people, you know, when they figured out where the, how they were bad, why that was true and why they cost so much. So um, in some ways, experience in that area sort of tempers your decisions and makes you be much more thorough about what you've done and make sure that you could answer the phone and hope, hopefully be smiling the whole time. Um, but as consumers, you have to be careful. And I don't know how, how you do it, but um, you got to ask around and find people that you trust that have the part that have used it and that are happy with it. There's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of good stuff that, that will make your bike better, but there's a lot that isn't. And it's really hard to sort out which stuff is good and which stuff isn't. 3D violet anodizing doesn't always prove the final usefulness of the thing. In regards to front suspension, is there a certain reason why you choose rock shocks over <coughs> down the market? Um, yeah, I, I know Paul Turner, so you could you should take this with a grain of salt, probably. But um, I think having ridden a lot on these and tested all the others to some extent. So I have a lot more experience on the rock shocks than I do on any of the others. That they work better than any of the others. Um, Compared to like the Mantos. Yeah, yeah. I think that none of them are that good. That they all could be improved. Um, Manitou's in particular, I think, have a fairly good overall structure. You know, I like the larger diameter blades. I like the amount of overlap that they have between the bearings. You know, they they seem very durable to me. But the, the fact that they aren't hydraulic dam hydraulically dampened, that they have elastomers in there, which are primarily springs. There's not much in the way of anything in there to, to slow the thing down. To, to my feel and to my, the way I like a bike to ride, those, those don't work very well. And <sighs> We've done a lot of tests on that. They're a little better than rock shocks, but not much. And yeah. Well, now I should say, we tested last year's model. I haven't tested this year's model, and they've taken a lot of material out of it to lighten it up. Because I, I don't know, one of the generic assessments that I've always done is uh, just grab the front brake and twist the handlebar. Mm -hmm. You can see how much the brakes, I mean, flex and soft, you can watch them. Right. I don't know, I've always, I've always felt that the magnitude flexed a great deal more than the uh, rock shock does. We, the way we measure that is we, we clamp the, the fork in a head tube. We support the stem rigidly with a bike on its side. And then we apply a force to a wheel and make a, an actual measurement of the deflection of the fork as a function of the weight that we apply. And we haven't found, again, not testing the latest model of Manitou, that they deflect more than rock shocks in that circumstance. They're, they're always just a little bit better. 
Um, if you put titanium blades in them or something, it all goes out the window and then they start flexing a lot more. To be frank, from my point of view, that's never been a real bother in riding. You know, it sort of bothers me that I know that that happens, but when I'm out riding, if that happens while I'm, while I'm turning, it, it, there's so much else going on while I'm making the turn that that doesn't end up affecting my ability to make the turn. There, there are some circumstances where, you know, if you're going along in a rut and you're on the side of the rut, you feel like the rut can kind of grab the wheel and pull it over. Um, that probably is, is the most significant thing um, that bothers me about it, and it's not that big a deal. I figure, I figure if I'm in that bad a shape anyway, I probably deserve to, you know, go flying out of the rut on my head. Um, I think that, that for the most part, the benefit of, of the hydraulic suspension is, is, is the big deal for me between RockShox and, and Manitou. And if, if they both worked harder on their designs, I'd be really happy because I don't think either of them are that good. They're okay. The, that, a lot of the mountain bike industry is, is based on fads and the people that are involved in the manufacturing of the parts that are subject to those fads are really paranoid about getting things to market quickly. And so a lot of times development goes in the tank when the object is to get things available for you know, the Anaheim show in September and no, uh, nothing else is really a priority. And so you have to be really careful about that. And I think RockShox over the years have proven that. The RS1 was kind of a disaster. The MAG-20s were a real disaster. And the MAG-21s are actually working pretty good. And now these, hopefully with the aluminum sliders, will be even better. But that's a big, a big question. But it sounds like, at least from my point of view, that they've got the basic idea stable. And now they're starting to make incremental improvements on that stable design, where before it wasn't stable. They were still fishing around for stuff. And I think a lot of the suspended bikes that are coming out are the same way. They're, they're probably going to have big problems in the first six months to a year, depending on how hard you ride them. And the next generation will be much better, and the next generation following that will be much better. And maybe it takes three or five for them to get really sorted out. Um, and it's up to you whether you feel like you need the advantage right away and you can live with the downside of a bike that maybe wear out, wears out quickly or has some other mechanical problem. And if that is to your advantage, then you just got to know going in that you're going to be replacing little parts more often than you would ordinarily. And if it isn't that big a deal, then you just wait until it's obviously sorted out. When you say the 20s were a disaster, what was the problem? <clears throat> they broke. <laughs> the damping didn't work very well in them. The damping tended to screw up on the inside pretty often. The MAG-20s that I had, admittedly I tweaked with them a little bit so this may not apply, <laughs> um, would break top out O-rings. There was an O-ring inside the thing that was designed to stop it from coming up and slamming against the full extended um, metal to metal position. And when I rode hard, those would break up and go down inside the damping valves. And all of a sudden I'd find after the ride that the thing was just really funky, you know, just wouldn't work right. And I c you could take it apart and there'd be little chunks of O-rings stuck down inside the valves. If you're, if you're sensitive to the way the thing is working, you will notice that. As, um, and I've talked to a number of people that have had that problem. Is there a way, like if you have a current set of Mac 20s, that you can correct that problem without having to buy a new suspension? You, just, you just replace the O-rings on a regular <coughs> basis. I mean, I, I never got to the point where I was paranoid about it and did the maintenance ahead of schedule. But, you know, every couple of months I'd end up having to take them apart and, and fix them. And it was kind of a drag. <laughs> so and that, they're not horrible in the way they perform, but from the point of view of a manufacturer or an engineer, there were really blatant flaws with them. And I think that it wasn't, it was inevitable. It could have been sorted out had they waited two years and just done research and development for two years, in which case somebody else would have gone in and made a fork that was worse and sold a whole bunch of them and been a hero. Um, and so they, they decided to take that gamble and they didn't do too badly. I mean, there's a lot of people that raced with them and were happy and I was happy when I rode with them for the most part, but when they screwed up, I wasn't very happy. If you're, if you're good at servicing them and you know that happens and you don't mind taking them apart every now and then, it's no big deal. Back to the racing motorcycle thing. I didn't like putting crankshafts and transmissions in, in engines every other race, but you know, I didn't have anybody to bitch to, so all I had to do was, was do the work and hope the racer could win some races. You had to uh, address a lot of the inaccuracies as far as magazines are concerned. Magazines are, for the most part, inaccuracies with ads between the, the, the inaccuracies. <laughs> most, of, most of what I, I think, I don't know, I feel bad about a lot of people that, you know, are, are on the general open 
the market that read a magazine and base their, their judgments as far as buying on what a magazine said because so much of it is either incorrect or biased depending right. upon you know, who spends what as far as advertising. And I, I've given up reading them. I, I honestly don't read them. Yeah. Um, our concerns with magazines is how misleading they'll be and how that will affect us by affecting market changes. You know, if they come out tomorrow and say the greatest things are red saddles, we probably should have red saddles in stock. If they say the greatest thing is riding without saddles, then we're stuck because we think riding with saddles is really important even if mountain bike action decides it's not, you know, and we'll just argue with them. The, um, Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, they don't have to tell the truth. That, you know, they have nobody came out and said, listen, we want, we want everything you guys to write down to be true. And I think they, they're not purposely misleading anybody, but I think that they're, the level of um, journalism and engineering integrity there is really low. And so they'll, they'll say things that they believe are true and that aren't. And it's pretty frustrating. You should be really careful when you read magazines to check out any claims that they make. Um, there are British magazines you can subscribe to where that's not true. And there are German magazines you can subscribe to where that's not true. But the British ones are more accessible for most people. Um, it's a little more expensive, but they do a much better job on you know, evaluating components and being a little skeptical, skept skeptical about performance claims and things like that. Well, yeah, that's why I say that the Germans are probably, German magazines are probably harder to get to for most people. Are there places to demo your bikes on dirt that you know? I never had like a demo session like skiing. We've been talking about that. <coughs> for the most part, you can always arrange something. Um, sometimes the shops, if, if shop employees have them and you leave like your three thousand dollars in cash <laughs> unmarked bills on the on the counter you can con somebody into a quick ride um, I know we do that on occasion if somebody is a, a fit question or if there's some issue that they want to resolve um, I loan my own bike out a fair amount um, so that those things can be done and if you do it with a dealer you just have to leverage you know you just have to say look at him I'm really interested in one of these things but I really like to try it out tell that employee of yours who has that bike to loan it to me for a couple hours um, but, but typically that's, you just have to be kind of creative in the way you approach that, but it can be done. If it's a new bike, it's really hard to do. Um, the things end up just looking, looking used after the first 15 minutes. You know, not, not beat up, but you know, just dirty and harder to sell. So it's hard to get a dealer to do that with a brand new bike. Do you guys have any, any plans on that or any methods on that? Okay. In the small frame sizes, where does it get to a point that a person should really go down to a 24-inch quarter versus a 26-inch quarter? You know, it, it probably should be done, well, let's see, based only on rider proportion, it could be done at our extra small frames. It's not really necessary at the small size. We used to make custom bikes with those, with those wheels on occasion. The problem is that the downside of doing that is so bad that we've decided against it for a number of reasons. You can't buy rims, you can't buy tires, it's hard to find gearing that you need, especially with Shimano since they don't sell accessory um, ratios for a lot of their gears. And so we thought that other than in the custom instances where we could buy 
half a dozen tires for the person ahead of time. Um, that it's very difficult. It makes their life so miserable that it's better to compromise on performance a little bit than, than to put them in the position of having to find really rare components. Having said that, I think the compromise we make in, in performance is really small. The, the issue is primarily one of stability and those bikes would be shorter if we had smaller wheels and they're slightly longer because of the fact that we use 26 inch wheels and that only increases the stability of the bike slightly and, and takes away a little bit of the cornering quickness. Um, but we think that's a, a pretty fair compromise to make for the ability to buy current tires and current rims. Eleven inch C two. This is Rick. Is this a large? Yeah. So this is a seventeen inch C two. So six inches off. Yeah. We have a, the woman in our our company that does shipping and some of the machining has an extra small and um, she fits on it well. It's nice to see it because she has a seat post out all the way. You know, typically women that are riding really small bikes are maybe five feet, five one, something like that. How long is it? How long is it You're sort of taxing my, my ability to remember things, I'm afraid. It's just the right length along the top. Um, <laughs> From one end to the other. How am I doing? This is the bike for you. Um, I think that th these guys have a spec sheet that where you could get that number. Um, that's, that's a problem. A small end, often you can get a frame that's short enough that the bike looks like a dachshund. Mm -hmm. And it's designed for somebody with really long arms. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to get your weight over mm -hmm. the front tire, so you lose any ability to control right. the front wheel. Yeah, believe it or not, I'm kind of I can relate to that because I'm kind of long-legged for my height, and so I ride a medium bike, which is two inches smaller than this, with the seat post out pretty far. But if I don't, I have short arms and a short torso, and if I don't, I'm in that same situation where it's all I can do to reach forward to the bars, and I can't get behind the saddle, and I can't shift my weight around on the bike very well. Um, I don't know what to tell you other than that the numbers that we got were based on my custom bike experience and a lot of the small bikes that I made for custom frame customers were, were women and so a lot of the statistics in there were, were based on the sort of torso to leg length that, that shorter women would have. But I think that you have to just make your own decision on that. You know, you sit on a few bikes and you can make some comparisons of, of top tube length. And if we need ever to supply more information on that, more specific information, we can. Including there is one built up in our shop for, um, you know, that could be sat on if you ever were in Santa Cruz area. It's really hard to make decisions about expensive bikes and sizing them that in advance when you can't actually sit on the thing and, you know, tweak with it a little bit and make sure that it's just the size you want. A lot of that information can be gotten from an old bike though, even if, you do, if, even if it doesn't fit you right. If you know the saddle to pedal measurements and saddle to handlebar measurements and you say this is I think about an inch long and look at here I'm only using a five centimeter stem to get this then it's pretty easy to, know, to, to analyze that and to know where to go with a, another frame. So it's even if a bike doesn't fit you, your best guess at where you need it to be and all the dimensions from it can be really useful in terms of getting confident that the, the, the new bike is the right thing. Anything else? Would you like to expand a little on your rear suspension prototype? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember reading that article, Bicycle Guy, probably about two, two and a half years ago. Uh -huh. I did that interview with you. Right. I showed the, the guy the, the, the drawing, but I wouldn't let him talk about it. The, yeah, I'm tempted like everybody to want to have the you know the first and the best, but I can't know that it's the best unless we have time to work it out, and that's what it's that's what we're doing right now is taking time to work it out. The other thing is even my best guess at this point probably will change pretty dramatically in say within the next five years because when we come out with something, it'll be what I think is the best thing I can do given I, what I know we can make it out of, um, and what will be reliable, and then immediately I'll probably decide that I could do a lot better and start working on something else. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not going to be the last word for the next decade. Um, but I'm going to make sure that it'll do exactly what we say it'll do and that 
you know, it, would, it wouldn't, be, um, wouldn't fall short in any significant way so that no one will be pissed if they buy one and come back a year later and say, look at the things falling apart or it doesn't really hold up very well or something like that. I don't so like those conversations. One of the problems is with the triple chain ring of getting something where the, the bike is going to work in a similar way mm -hmm. no matter what chain ring you're in. You right. Know, so a lot of bikes, or pretty much all of them, are going to behave differently. Yeah, they're, I mean, that's one of so many problems when you start thinking about letting things move around in the back end. Yeah. Um, that it's one of those, again, one of those things where rushing into it isn't, doesn't seem like the right way to, to go. Does anyone here ride with an ALSA stem, a flex stem, or one of the, whatever they're called? I rode with an ALSA for quite a while. What did you think? Did you like it? Uh, in some ways, yeah. And it was nice from a, a comfort point of view. Uh -huh. Do you think you could, if you had the same course and some time to train on each, that you could go as fast on that, on the course, as you could on a MAG-21 or a Mana 2 or something? Uh, depending on the course. Bumpy. <laughs> yeah. Rough, bumpy, technical, you know, have to know where you're going and where the wheels are pointed. Yeah. Yeah. But it was nice, uh, the steering felt really good on it, mm -hmm. but after a while the stem started to get a little bit of play in it. And right. Right. That, that's my point about durability of suspension bikes. You can see a lot of them have like 15 moving parts, little links and washers and pivots and things all over the bike. <coughs> Imagine what happens as the clearances in all those things change as you ride in mud or you know, dust or whatever. Um, to restore, like the stem, to restore it to its original condition is not a trivial job. You know, going in there and fitting new bushings and rebuilding the whole thing. And we did some of that with motorcycle stuff and found out it was no fun at all. And trying to work it out in some simpler way became a real significant thing. Not that you couldn't make that work well, but the object of all those little moving parts made it very difficult to, um, to, to keep and maintain. And, and if you thought hard enough about it, there was almost always a way to work it out some other way that didn't involve all the little bits and pieces. What are your feelings on the question you asked me about going as fast? Well, I, I wrote a magazine article and, and confidently predicted that, that would be the, the result of that effort on their part. They've made a big marketing pitch to try to persuade everybody and anybody who says, well, that, that doesn't sound right to me, becomes a, an enemy and, you know, the hated traditionalist or, or motorcyclist. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, that there are reasons why, concrete reasons why, um, it, it won't perform up to the level of a suspended fork, and I explained that in the article. And so far I haven't found anybody that said much different than that. You know, that, that after time, they work okay, they probably work better than I would have expected them to, and I admitted that, but that um, for the most part, um, they won't perform as well as a suspended fork, even given the, the liabilities and handicaps of the suspended fork. Yeah, yeah I was surprised how well it worked bad as I thought it might be, because mm -hmm. uh, when you just push it down on them, they feel really, just really springy, but right. your arms are acting as a damper to right. an extent. Right. Uh, it, it worked pretty decently for what it was, and as long as you, you kept the, the limitations in mind, it, it did right. certain things very well and other things not that well. Right. Okay. The wheel tracking with a suspension fork is smart. Right. Okay. Well, I'll leave you guys to your Saturday. It's my birthday today, so I've got to get home and party a little bit. Um, I want to thank um, Adventure for um, having me here. And um, if I, hopefully I um, raised a little bit of uh, controversy here. You guys can argue it out later. Call me if you need to. <laughs> And it's all on tape, so I can be sued easily if I actually said anything that offends anybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.